All right, well, I get the privilege of explaining what's happening tonight, uh, giving you an overview of what's coming, and then we'll have Brother Grant come and open us in the Word and with prayer. Uh, but I do want to read a couple of passages that I think will kind of direct our attention uh, to what exactly is going on tonight. Uh, first, in Titus chapter 1, uh, verses 5 to 9, we read this. Paul says to Titus, he says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach, must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So we see Paul give us both the church's role, the pastor's role, and the pastor's qualification, and the reason for all of this, all in, in one passage. So uh, that's part of what we're doing here, to affirm that these things that we read from Paul are true in, in Steve's life. Acts chapter 13, verses uh, 1 to 3, we see a, a description of what's going on, the dependence of the church on the Holy Spirit to make clear who is to be a messenger of God, for God, a shepherd of God's people. We see this Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. We see from just that description a reality of what happened in the early church. And it helps paint for us an understanding of what we get to do as believers to identify the work that the Spirit has done and to set apart people for the specific and special work of, of the ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 reminds us of the supernatural gifting that God gives to make, to make his servants useful. It says, do not neglect the gift, Paul's talking to Timothy, do not, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So Paul's language points to the finger, uh, points to the finger, the one giving the gift to God. God gave this gift to Timothy, and he says, don't neglect it. Instead, practice it, use it. God gifts for ministry, and men affirm the work of God. So really, that's, that's what tonight and tomorrow are about is affirming what we have seen God do and we touched on Ephesians chapter 4 last week uh, in the message we're reminded that God has gifts for all of us to use for his glory and his body and God also has gifts specifically for each of us to use uniquely and ordination is where we collectively recognize a man has been gifted by grace through the spirit's work to preach the unfathomable riches of Christ to his people. Uh, the Spirit's work to preach Christ's work is what we're identifying in Steve's life. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul goes on in verse 11, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we see clearly in God's word that he gifts us for service. We see clearly in God's word that he gifts all of us uniquely for service. We see clearly in God's word that these gifts are discernible to us. We can see them and recognize them, see the effects of them, and even feel the effects of, of them in our lives. And we see in God's word that we're to respect and honor those who are gifted by God and also hold them to a higher standard of holiness, a higher standard in their teaching and doctrine, a higher standard in all of their life. And so ordination is the opportunity to observe 
these gifts and knowledge and godliness tonight in Steve. And this council tonight is rather brief, but over the last several years, we've been able to observe these things. You've been in ministry with Steve. You've been served by Steve. You've even served Steve. All of these ways are opportunity for us to recognize the gift of God and the beauty of what God has done. So tonight and tomorrow, we're affirming that God has saved Steve, God has called Steve, and set him apart uniquely for gospel ministry. Tomorrow, the shepherds of Grace Bible Church, along with Dr. Chow, Dr. William Webster, and Judge George Crawford, will officially ordain Steve, a symbolic earthly affirmation of a divine work in Steve's life. And I, I think it's important for you to hear tomorrow uh, what's going to be said and affirmed of Steve, so that you can be thinking of these things as you uh, watch this process uh, tonight. So tomorrow we'll affirm uh, in Steve evidence of his faith in Jesus as his Lord and Savior, as his only means of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. We'll affirm and, and recognize evidence of Steve's Holy Spirit-motivated internal call to ministry. You'll get to hear a testimony of that in a little bit. We'll recognize and affirm evidence of the church's unified confirmation to Steve's ministry. We'll recognize and affirm Steve's past and present ministry have evidence of the Spirit's gifting in his teaching. We'll recognize and affirm in Steve's past and present life the character that qualifies him as a shepherd. And we'll, we'll see Steve's passion uh, lived out through a calling and gifting to shepherd like the good shepherd. We'll affirm that tomorrow. And then we'll lay our hands on Steve to symbolically uh, recognize and affirm the work of the Spirit in Steve's life, setting him apart for the ministry of the gospel, the equipping of the saints for your work of the ministry, all in the name of Christ. So tonight's an effort to allow all of us to make sure we know exactly what we're doing tomorrow, uh, that we're affirming the man that we think we're affirming. Uh, but like we told Steve earlier, we're, we're here doing this because uh, we love Steve and we want to affirm Steve. So though I teased about this being an interrogation, it's not an interrogation. We've been interrogating him for the last several years. You remember when he came from California. Some of you were a little suspect, but now you've seen uh, Steve loves the Lord and loves you as well. So this is an exciting night tonight. I'm excited for the, the decades of training that this represents, uh, the reality of what discipleship really and truly can accomplish in the life of a believer. It's a special, a special night that we get to see the product of lots of God's economy spent on the man Steve Crawford. So it's a blessing. And our brother Grant is going to come open us with scripture and prayer. All right, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his household, his own household, well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil." And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace thanking you for the opportunity that we have tonight to see how you have worked in Steve's heart and life how you have called him out of the domain of darkness and, and placed him in the 
kingdom of your beloved son, how you have equipped him and trained him to be one of your shepherds. And Father, as we affirm the training, the education, the life experience that you have instilled in him, uh, may it be an encouragement, may it be edifying to each one here as we see how you have worked in his heart and soul. Father, I, I pray for Steve tonight as he answers questions. May your uh, spirit work in him, give him clarity of thought, give him the presence to be able to articulate his love for you, his love for your word, his love for your people. Father, what a blessing it is for us to be able to be here tonight to see a demonstration of you equipping a young man for ministry and for him to demonstrate that in such a powerful way. Father, we commit this evening to you. May all that is said and done bring glory and honor to you. And we pray these things in your son's Jesus name. Amen. Well, before the men come up, we want to spend a few minutes singing together. So I invite you to stand with us as we worship together in song, 10,000 Reasons. <laughs>
Thank you, Hadley and Bryant. That was uh, one of my favorite hymns. I asked Hadley to do that one, and uh, I love that bridge that's added because that the one problem I've had with that hymn is it doesn't have the name of Jesus, but with that, that bridge, it adds the name of Jesus, and it's one of my favorite songs. Then that's what I want the focus to be on tonight, uh, not, not me, but the Lord. I, it's my privilege now to tell you my testimony briefly and call to ministry. I was born into a Christian home to believing parents who raised me in the truth, and they did everything they could to put me in the way of truth, uh, teaching me God's word in the home. Uh, our house was filled with scripture and hymns and uh, constantly bringing us to church, Awana, Sunday school, uh, sacrificing to put us through a Christian school. They did so much to put my brother and I in the way of truth with a hopeful prayer that God would work on our hearts. I was four years old when I first prayed what's called the sinner's prayer uh, with my dad in his car. I remember this was in the early 90s, so four-year-olds could still sit in the front of the car. Uh, and uh, I remember we, we were sitting in his Honda, uh, pulled over on the side of the road, and I remember that was the first time I asked the Lord to come into my life and save me. I don't know if that was the moment I was converted or not. The problem about being a, a, a good Christian kid growing up in a Christian home is that you are never quite sure a lot of the times when you go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It, it is a moment in time, but it's hard to tell when your life looks so similar. There was a preacher that I like listening to. Uh, I'll still now listen to him every now and then, named Raul Reese, who I disagree with him in some aspects of, of theology, but he has this testimony where he was in a, in a gang, and he was uh, actually, his life had spiraled out of control. He was desperate. He was actually waiting uh, to, to murder his wife. He had a shotgun. He was going to kill his wife and then end his own life when he heard the gospel through a preacher on TV, and the Lord radically saved him. And I remember thinking, man, I wish I had a testimony like that. I wish I, yeah, I know that's crazy to think about. No, you don't want a testimony like that if you can be spared from that. But I remember thinking it would be so neat to know when I went from darkness to light. And so wrestling with assurance of salvation was something that characterized much of my growing up. Uh, I remember being 13 years old and being terrified of Y2K, uh, thinking, you know, the whole world was going to end and, you know, planes were going to crash and gas lines were going to explode and I had the weight of Matthew 7 weighing on my heart, where the Lord said, depart from me, I never knew you. 13 was a, a significant point in my life. If I had to pick a point where I was saved, it would probably be that time where I cried out to the Lord uh, in, in fear of hearing those words, depart from me, I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness, uh, crying out to the Lord when I was 13, asking him to come into my life and and save me and change me. I, I do believe I started seeing changes in my life after that point. I, I enjoyed going to church. I enjoyed being a part of uh, the high school youth group and, and learning from my disciples, disciple leader uh, back at Grace Community Church uh, and studying the word, being in the word, going to Bible study. Uh, still wrestled with pride, still wrestled with, at times, hypocrisy. Uh, that continued on into college, but the Lord was continually shaping me, chipping away at, at arrogance, chipping away at pride. The Lord led me through a, a, a dark trial uh, near the end of my time in college where, again, wrestling with assurance of salvation uh, and really wrestling with some of the passages in Hebrews, thinking about the, the possibility of somebody who was close to the things of God and yet not truly born again. Um, uh, the Lord... Uh, the Lord answered some prayers. So there's, a, there's a song John Newton wrote, I ask the Lord that I may grow in faith and love and every grace. And John Newton talks about how God led him through deep, dark trials. And uh, I felt the Lord did that for me. But God sent many people into my life during that time. My parents, uh, well, Bill and my, my late mother-in-law, Paula, uh, and others in the church, and Dr. Chow graciously met with me weekly, sometimes for an hour and a half, uh, just to, to talk me through my anxieties and doubts and fears and, and really help me understand being a believer means that you believe. A believer believes. They trust Christ. Christ is more kind, more gracious than we often usually give him credit for, and he is able and willing to save. That was a very formative time. I remember being grateful to Abner for his time uh, weekly meeting with me, and now actually being in ministry for several years, I realized just what a sacrifice that was. I'm just so grateful to everybody who helped me through that time. I came out of that time confident in my position for the Lord. Uh, interwoven throughout this same time, the Lord was working on my heart a call to ministry. It was 
uh, growing up in, in my parents' home and talking to my dad about his experience as, a, as an elder and a shepherd at, at Grace Community Church, I would often ask him about what it's like to be an elder. And he would, he would pull back the curtain and let me know. And, and I just remember thinking, man, that's, that's really neat. What, what a privilege. Not, not just to be a leader, but to shepherd people in the church. I remember thinking, I don't know what career I'll pursue, but whatever career I pursue, I hope I get to serve as an elder. I hope I get to do what my dad does at church. Um, it was in 2005, I took a biblical counseling class at the Master's College, and I had to read a book called The Minister of Shepherd by Charles Jefferson. And that was, even though I'd grown up at a great church with great pastors, really reading that book, Minister as Shepherd, really showed me this is what a faithful pastor does. Not just a preacher, but a pastor, because a pastor is, is more than just a preacher. And really reading that book and, and saying, that's, that's what I want to do. That's, I don't know how, but that's what I want to do. And interwoven that was struggles with assurance, struggles with pride, um, but the Lord kept growing that desire. In 2007, I spent a semester studying in Israel, and pretty much every day I was immersed in the study of the scriptures. Uh, I came away from that semester convicted over my own pride over intellectualism, but also uh, encouraged that if I went to graduate school, I'd want to be it in biblical studies. I'd want to study the Bible more because it was always exciting. Uh, I had previously thought about going into different fields, and they, they lost their appeal. The more and more I got to study the Word of God, uh, the more it became more attractive. I started seminary in 2011. Uh, around the same time, Anna and I were, we had gotten married in 2010. We were serving in junior high ministry at Grace Community Church, and we loved junior high ministry. It was a, a, a blast. It was so fun. And the, the fun part was watching 12 and 13-year-olds uh, really get what it means to follow Christ. Uh, that was that was the most exciting thing. She had her own little posse of junior high girls. I had my posse of junior high guys, and now they're all, they're all getting married. It's kind of, it makes me feel old, but this was, this was over 10 years ago, and just having them over at our, uh, our house on Saturdays or Friday nights, there's this, uh, there's this one story where we were watching a movie with some of my junior high guys, and all of a sudden, one of them, he, he's like 80 pounds soaking wet, and he, he ate too much food, and yeah, it's, he baptized our apartment, and <laughs> Anna was so kind to clean the whole thing up. It was, but we, we loved junior high ministry, and we loved, even with that, we loved seeing the Word of God take root in these kids' lives. It was, it was a major blast. Seminary was fun. It was also encouraging. It was also a trial. Uh, one of the major lessons the Lord convicted me throughout seminary was, yes, I wanted to do ministry, but I had certain thoughts. I wanted it to look a certain way. I, I wanted it to, I wanted my life after seminary to follow a prescribed course. Uh, I loved Master's College, Master's Seminary, and that, that had been my home my whole life. Uh, and, and I realized I had not relinquished over to the Lord even that. I, I knew I wanted to do ministry. He was calling me to ministry, but I wanted it to look my way. And Seminary was a six-year process in which the Lord stripped me of, of even that. Uh, it was in 2016 when I realized that I had been holding on to life after seminary looking my way and not God's way, that I began to think, okay, Lord, what would you have? And there was a church in another state that was looking for a youth pastor, and I knew men at that church. I knew it to be a, a solid church, and I, I started an application process for youth pastor at that church, and it's a great church. And in doing that uh, application, it wound up being 32 pages long. Uh, I just was preaching to myself on why I love shepherding youth, and we were, we were all set to go to that one church, uh, and um, I ran into to Bart in, in March of that year, and, uh, and one thing led to another, and uh, the Lord confirmed that he did want us to do youth ministry, but it wasn't in that state. It was, it was here, and the Lord brought us here. Uh, when, when I think about a call to ministry, I, I don't think about it in terms of nebulous like ministry out there. I think about the privilege it is to serve here. Um, we moved here four and a half years ago. It'll be, it'll be five years ago in July. Uh, this place has become home. You have become home. Oh, we love this body and how you have cared for our family, especially when we lost Anna's mom. You guys, uh, it is a privilege to be with you and to pastor here and to uh, grow with you. You've ministered to us and cared for us, and it's a joy to be a pastor here. So that's my testimony and call to ministry. Thank you.
Come on up, guys. I'm going to pass it. No, you just take that. Get that down there. Well, we, uh, we get the privilege to have a pretty special stage. I'm saying that because I'm, I'm in the red chair and they're in the blue chairs. There's an obvious distinction. So we have, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we have Dr. Chow down here. He's written the book on biblical hermeneutics we ha- and others, writing a commentary on Job, and we don't have time for all of his production. We have Dr. William Webster, who literally wrote a book on church history, not figurative. He's been here before, maybe you remember. We have Judge George Crawford, or Dr. George Crawford. We'll go with Judge. Maybe it'll scare Steve a little bit. Obviously has a close connection with Steve. Do you, do you want to give just like a 30-second why these guys are here? Would you do that? That would be question number one. Yeah, I mean, many men have, have poured into me, and I, I'm just thankful that some of them are, are live streaming. Um, but uh, obviously my dad has... I mean, I know, I know, I didn't know how much a parent loves their kids until I had a kid. So just thankful for all my, my dad has done. Bill is not just a father-in-law. That's, you know, some people, that's just the title. Bill is, Bill is a father. And then Habner is just, I'm, I, I'm not underestimating to say I, I might have, I might not be here today if it wasn't for Habner. When I went through that really dark period, um, Habner was God's conduit to help me have hope. That's awesome. Well, we, we have uh, up here represented different disciplines that we're going to consider. I am basically a spiritual stop clock. That's, that's, all, I'm, that's all I'm doing. So That's why I'm in the red chair. I should have worn like a zebra, you know, referee outfit. But uh, we're, we're going to have three disciplines that we're going to discuss over the next 45 minutes. We're having Bible knowledge, and particularly the Old Testament, Bible knowledge and interpretation with Dr. Chow. We'll have practical shepherding, leadership counseling questions by Judge Crawford, and we'll have church history with Dr. Webster. So they're going to uh, fire off some questions as we uh, kick things off. They're going to give a couple of rapid fire questions that Steve's instructed to answer, to answer in like one to three sentences. And then they'll ask him some questions where he can elaborate on. So, uh, yeah, so this, this will be great. How about uh, Dr. Chow, you open things up with a few rapid fire questions? Okay, so let's say here's a rapid fire one. Some young person comes up to you. And you don't have much time because their parents are saying, hey, we got to go, we got to go. And they said, hey, I just heard in class today, or not today, like this week in school, that the Bible in commanding uh, the Israelites to kill all the Canaanites, that's genocide. So the Bible's immoral. What do I do? Speak to that. Oh. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say say, I think your parents are calling you. No. Uh, (laughs) uh, We have to start with what we all deserve. We all deserve death and hell. Uh, We we need to approach this with the fact that we're all sinners and we we deserve to be crushed for our sin. Um, When we think about the conquest of Canaan, uh, it, it was not that the Israelites were slaughtering every person left and right, but they did, they did have a mandate from God to take the promised land to fulfill what God said was rightfully theirs. Um, there were three cities that they absolutely leveled, but the rest, uh, they were to drive out the inhabitants, and that did involve, that did involve death. Um, part of this is that God had given hundreds of years for the Canaanites to repent. Uh, there was, a, there, there was a, a testimony, a witness from the time of the patriarchs of what was righteousness, what was good. Um, and they did not. Then the Lord said, the iniquity of the Gentiles is now complete. Um, it was God's land, God's people. We are all in his hands, and it was his prerogative to send them to do that. Um, I, would, I would then say what Jesus tells us in the New Testament uh, when the, the men came to him and talked about the tower that fell on the 18 or the people that, that Pilate slaughtered. Um, Jesus said, 
don't question about why this happened or what, what do you think about this. Realize that death is certain for all of us. Are you repenting? Are you turning? That's what the Canaanites should have done. There was a witness from the days of the patriarchs, and they didn't. And their iniquity, it reached the point of time's up. Yeah. Time's up. Okay. That was not one to three. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's it a, was a great answer, but go ahead again. Yeah. Oh, oh am I supposed to ask another Yeah, yeah another okay. ra- rapid I, fire. I just rapid, thought that sorry, he had fire. a lot of semicolons in his sentence. Yeah, that was very so, Pauline run-on. Yeah, sorry. yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, really quickly, okay, another person runs up to you, you know, and their parents are also calling them to go home, and they said, in, in school today, or not today, right, earlier, uh, man, they're just bashing six-day creation. What, what, is it a myth? Is it a, is it a poem? How do I understand this? How, and how do I handle the whole science thing, too? Uh, I'd say three things. First is the grammatical structure of Genesis 1 through 11, and that includes 1 and 2, is clearly narrative. It's, it's not a poem. Their poetry has structure. Narrative has structure. And what we see in the Hebrew is, is narrative structure. Uh, secondly, I'd say the Old Testament, I mean, Exodus 20, uh, the, the Ten Commandments, God literally says through Moses, in six days I created the world. Um, the... The Old Testament, Jesus himself, Mark 13, talks about the days of creation. Uh, and the New Testament writers all affirm literal young earth creation, a literal Adam, literal Eve, literal fall. Uh, and then the third thing I would say, so the grammar, the affirmation of scripture, uh, and then just the gospel falls apart if creationism isn't true. I mean, just the comparison Paul makes in Romans 5, there is a literal Adam and we fell in him and there's Christ, and we're saved through him. Creation has to be true. That's great. Good. Dr. Webster, a couple of brief church, church history. history questions. That's a slight oxymoron. But. Well, Steve, you know, church history tends to be a subject relegated to guys like you in seminary. It's an academic study. Why do you think just regular folks should have a knowledge of church history. I'm, I'm taking this from, from Nate Busnitz, but it's the ABC. There's apologetics, bibliography, and curiosity. Uh, apologetics, church history helps us defend our faith. We, there's so many battles for why we believe what we believe have been fought throughout 2,000 years, and you are unprepared if, you're, if you don't study uh, the lessons throughout church history. So apologetics, defend your faith. Uh, bibliography, uh, not bibliography, biography. <laughs> Biography. Uh, we, we have examples of men and women who've stood firm in the face of death and torture. You know, men like Luther, women like Lady Jane Grey, um, they inspire us to keep going. God was faithful to them, he's faithful to us. So apologetics, biography, and then curiosity. You drive around Hutch, there's 95 churches. Why do we have so many denominations? Why, why does the church exist the way it is? Church history explains that. So ABC. Yeah. Good. No. Mm-hmm. Think about church history in the broad sense, you know, 2,000 years. Is this simply uh, a history of disparate, unrelated dates, events, people, or is there some kind of an underlying theme that you see fulfilled throughout church history? Yeah, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, uh, I will, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Church history is the, the story of Jesus fulfilling that promise. Building his church, Satan tries to attack and tear it down, and Satan can't and never will. And we see that throughout church history. Amen. That's great. All right, Dr. C- or Judge Crawford. Let's, uh, let's go towards practical shepherding, practical leadership counseling with a few rapid-fire questions. First of all, drawing on to something you'd said earlier, Steve, during that dark period of time, uh, I remember you thinking that you may have committed the unpardonable sin. A young college student walks up to you, a young student walks up to you and uh, makes a similar suggestion, a similar statement. What's your response? What criteria would you 
bring to his or her attention in thinking through that issue? Well, you look at the unpardonable sin, and it's not just saying certain words. It's a, it's a heartfelt rejection of Jesus and his lordship, of, of who he said he was. And so if there is any desire in the person's life to bow the knee to Christ, I'd say you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. 1 Peter 1.8 says that you have not seen him, you love him. Uh, if you have love for Christ, even a flicker or a glimmer, or what Rick Holland, who's one of my, my college pastors, he said, the want to want. If you have the want to want, that's an encouraging, encouraging sign. Um, is there love for Christ? 1 Corinthians 16 says, if any man has no love for the Lord, that man is a curse, or let that man be accursed. So if there's any love or even the want to love Christ, I'd say press on. Uh, and then I, I, I think the thing that was most helpful for me was actually reading the book of Hebrews. I remember terrified of the warning passages, but then actually reading the passages in between the warning passages. You know, Christ is able to save to the uttermost since he always lives to make intercession for them. Um, I, I'd say, I'd gently tell that guy, it's okay, man up, let's read Hebrews together. We can do this and yeah. Drawing on, uh, in your testimony, you were commenting on your time in Israel. As you know, uh, one of the faculty men, faculty there that you loved and trusted, has since denied the deity of Christ. Uh, you also learned while you were in college that uh, one of the chief professors in the seminary had been uh, found to have been in an affair for approximately a year and a half. And you and I talked about that at the time. This kind of thing happens where something will occur. You may find that someone you've trusted and you've worked with uh, stabs you in the back, acts in a manner that is inconsistent with the faith. What text, what fallback position do you have from scripture that will protect you against cynicism and disillusionment when this occurs in the future? First Peter 2 talks about the Lord's example. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you may follow in his steps. Uh, he, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And then in chapter 4, verse 19, Peter uses that same, he takes it from describing Christ to an imperative, let those who suffer while doing good entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Um, that's, that's my go-to when things get really hard and you just realize like the Lord has got this Christ Christ went through darker valleys and deeper discouragements and he entrusted the one who judges justly I can do the same I ran the question by Dr. Craig and from the seminary once as I was driving him home and you mentioned already the verse that he would go to I will build my church and nothing will prevail against it Good. Thank you. Well, good work, Steve. Made it through the rapid fire. Okay. Now, now you're going to get questions that you'll have somewhere around five minutes to answer. So don't, don't go sermonizing. Okay. But five-ish minutes. So Dr. Chow, you want to give him an Old Testament question? Sure. This will be a great temptation to do sermonizing, so we'll see how disciplined you are. <laughs> <clears throat> but, you know, as people read the Bible... Sometimes there are books that are more challenging than others. We know that while the Bible's clear, it does involve hard work, and those two are not mutually exclusive. So a congregant comes up to you and says, well, praise the Lord, this year I made it to the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel. You know, usually you quit by Leviticus. So praise the Lord, it's like July, and I'm still going. I don't understand anything in here. Help. So walk us through. You, here's, here's where you get choice. Right? This is not pure Calvinism where I'm going <laughs> to cause you to do a book, but you can, you can have a choice. One of three uh, of the major prophets walk us through it. I would, well, my favorite of the major prophets is Isaiah. Uh, a basic breakdown of Isaiah is chapters 1 through 39. Uh, the standard description is, uh, God's chastisement. And God begins in the opening five chapters with an indictment of his people. 
He's calling them into a courtroom and saying, you have sold yourselves to sin, but even now there's still hope. Um, if you return to me, come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as wool. And, and those, those two themes are woven throughout the whole book, but, but even those, those 39 chapters, there's hope. There's like a, a thread of hope, but a whole lot of rebuke uh, because sin is awful and evil and it merits the wrath of God. Uh, and it's not just limited to the people of Judah or the people of Israel. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah, uh, while it does focus on God's people specifically, there's, there's rebukes for the whole world. Uh, in fact, God says there's judgment coming on the whole world. And, and even woven throughout that, you've you got to understand, Isaiah is, is getting a series of prophetic revelations where he sees the judgment that is to come for Israel, for Judah, for the surrounding nations, but there's also a day coming when a branch that comes from the, the root of David will rule in righteousness and, and reign in righteousness here on earth and then ultimately throughout eternity. And so that's the first 39 chapters. Uh, judgment with a thread of hope. Judgment with a thread of hope. Um, there's a narrative portion that closes out those 39 chapters in which you see specifically in the house of Judah um, those two themes woven together where uh, it's in the time of Hezekiah. You have the Assyrians. They've, they've come to the gates of Jerusalem. Um, they're, they're threatening to, to take away the people or to, to lay siege to Jerusalem. And, and God, I remember you saying this when we were in Israel, Jesus, in the middle of the night, kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers to show that you don't, you don't challenge God and win. Uh, and yet even Hezekiah, who is a righteous man, a godly man, he sees the deliverance of God, but then sadly there's a sad end where the last two chapters of that section, um, even though God has given them deliverance from Assyria, ambassadors from the up-and-coming Babylonian Empire come, and instead of turning to God, Hezekiah shows off all his treasury and all his soldiers, and, he, and God rebukes him for that. Um, so you just see that there's this thread of hope, but there's also judgment even in the best of people, or chastisement in the best of people. So what do you do with that? Well, that's the second half of Isaiah. Uh, a corner is, is turn beginning in, turned and beginning in, in chapter 40, uh, where you have the first 39 chapters, God's chastisement, then 40 through 66, uh, 27 chapters, God's comfort. Uh, and, and God says, how, how are we going to reconcile the wrath and this future in which uh, the 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 branch from the house of David rules here on earth. How, how does this all come together? Well, it comes together in the servant, uh, in, in this Messiah person who's coming. He is the branch. He's coming. He's the one that was prophesied all the way back in the garden, uh, the one in Genesis 3.15. Uh, and there's, there's uh, four passages throughout this section that focus on the servant and how he will bring salvation to God's people, but not just to God's people. He's a light to the Gentiles. Uh, and how does he do that? Well, that's that's 52, 13 through all of 53. He, he, takes, he takes our sin on him. And because he takes our sin on him, by his wounds we are healed. That's how, that's how you can have wrath and yet also hope. Um, and it's not just wrath, because we all deserve just wrath. You can have wrath, yes, but also hope, because for those whom God has chosen, the servant took their sins on him. And then a future is coming which we see in 66, uh, a future is coming where those who belong to the Messiah will enjoy uh, bliss with him forever, and, and those who have remained enemies will be judged forever. So that's how I'd walk somebody through Isaiah. That's great. How about we do another Old Testament? Yeah. So another person comes up to you, and um, they're, they're just really confused about eschatology. They, they've wrestled with it a lot, and They've been reading the book of Daniel since we're in the Old Testament, and we've already covered a little bit of Isaiah. So walk, walk somebody through, you know, some of the prophetic passages. You know, don't wax eloquent about Daniel and the lion's den. We're talking about passages like Daniel 2 and 7 and 8 and 9 and such, and how you would explain the eschatology of those texts. Okay. Uh, Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, well, the theme of Daniel, and this, this actually includes both the, the narrative passages that, that you do in Sunday school, and so you wonder, like, why do you have Lion's Den and Shadrach, Meshach, Fiery Furnace, and, 
all this? How does that work with all these passages of like this bear and this leopard and this goat and they're eating one another and you know, what, what on earth, this, how does this make sense? Uh, it's because God is sovereign over everything in history. He, he, he as Daniel says uh, in Daniel chapter two and as Nebuchadnezzar responds in, in two and then in four, uh, he's the one who sets up kings and takes down kings. He's the one who sets up empires and takes down empires. And he's sovereign over the small things, like four boys choosing to eat vegetables, and yet they look healthy, uh, healthier than those that are eating meat, right? Uh, he's sovereign over the small things, and he's sovereign over nations. So in Daniel chapter 2, you see God's sovereignty over the, the future empires, uh, over Nebuchadnezzar and, and the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire and the Greeks and Rome, and then a, a future coming empire that is like Rome and yet different, and yet the, the kingdom of God is that massive rock that smashes all of them, and it can't be, can't be thwarted. So Daniel 2 shows us that over the scope of world history, God's kingdom always prevails. Daniel 7 is pulling back the curtain and showing God's sovereignty from the viewpoint of heaven. Uh, it's, it's the moment that we see in, in Revelation 4 and 5, specifically chapter 5, where the son takes the title deed or, or authority, uh, title deed. It's a scroll in Revelation 5, but the right to rule, the right to reign, the right to execute judgment over the whole world. Um, why, does, why does world history go the way it goes? It's because the son is the only one who is worthy, and we see that in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 8 is... a uh, a different instead of a statue, it's it's beasts, but it's a, it's a retelling of the the successive empires: Babylonian, Medo-Persia, Greece, uh, Rome, and then renewed Rome. Well, Rome, uh, and it's so accurate that uh, when when Alexander the Great came to conquer, uh, he came to the Holy Land. The rabbis went out and met him, and they read from that passage, and they, they basically said, "We knew you were coming." Um, and then Daniel chapter nine uh, is the the, the coming Antichrist is, while well, the main focus, there's 70 weeks, 69 weeks, uh, a week in the understanding is a period of seven years, 69 uh, from the moment of the return of the exiles to the, the Holy Land, and then there's a prince who's cut off from his people, um, and there's a break, and then there's a prince who is to come, who he's different than the prince who is cut off. The prince who is to come will be a man, this is the latter half of Daniel 9, who makes a, a covenant with God's people, and that kicks off the final week. Um, but then he shows his true colors as being false to that covenant. That, that prince who is to come is the Antichrist, and that final week is uh, God's wrapping up of all of world history uh, when he defeats that. When the true prince, who was cut off but then is raised, he defeats that false prince, the Antichrist. It's good. You're welcome to ask follow-ups. If you, I mean, if you feel like it was insufficient. Wow, what a guy. See, they love you, Steve. Yeah. They're, they're, they love you. All right, Dr. Webster, why don't you uh, give us a couple of, of church history questions Steve can wax on. Okay, one of the major characteristics of what we call the patristic age, and just for sake of simplicity, say 100 to 500, um, AD. In that time frame, it was major theological developments, and one of the major aspects of that period of time are the calling of ecumenical councils. The first one, which is Nicaea, which was in the early part of the fourth century. Uh, is considered probably one of the most significant and far-reaching of the church councils that were called. It's the first ecumenical council of the church of the post-apostolic age. Give us kind of an overview, if you could, of the history of Nicaea, some of the major players that were involved, and what the significance is. Why is it considered so far-reaching? Why is it so important? So the, the lead up to the Council of Nicaea was sparked by a man named Arius. Arius had been an, an elder in the church. He wasn't just some guy outside the church. He kind of fulfills Paul's warning in Acts 20 
that among you will, will come savage wolves. Uh, Arius had uh, been a deacon or an elder, I can't remember, but he was a leader of some kind who began teaching that Christ was not equal to the Father, that he was a created being, that he was the most powerful created being, like a, like a super angel or a demigod or something. But uh, it, that there was a time that Christ did not exist, that Christ was the first thing that was created. Um, Athanasius and an older man named Alexander, Alexander was Athanasius' bishop or pastor, uh, responded to Arius and, and to this heresy that was starting to spread across the Roman Empire uh, like wildfire uh, and realizing that the, the very nature of the gospel hinged on whether or not Christ is God. Uh, the gospel is at stake. Jesus must be fully God and fully man. Uh, he must be fully man to be our representative, and he must be fully God to, to take on infinite wrath, which is what we deserve to pay. Um, the, the gospel doesn't work unless we have a sinless God-man. Uh, and for Arius to say what he was saying is, is denying the foundation of the gospel. So uh, the com many common people, not everybody, but it, enough to make this a major problem, were starting to believe in Arianism. And uh, thankfully, the vast majority of, of Christians across the Roman Empire recognized this for what it was, but it was creating a big fur, fur in, the, in the church such that Constantine said, okay, we need to have a meeting. We need to sort this out. And uh, in 325, uh, over 300 uh, bishops and church leaders got together in Nicaea uh, to, which I, I, I think is in Turkey, Asia Meyer, uh, to hash this out and to, to, to nail down what do we believe. And thankfully, all but, all but three men, Arius and two others, uh, overwhelmingly affirmed. They didn't make Jesus God. That's, that's one thing people need to understand. They didn't, it wasn't, Jesus wasn't made God at Nicaea. He was recognized to be what the church had always believed him to be as fully man, yes, but also 100% fully divine. Uh, and uh, out of that came the Nicene Creed, uh, which is a, a statement that our hope is in Christ. Uh, the, the very gospel hinges on the fact that he is not just fully man, but fully God. So let me follow up with something real quick. Sure. So what was the foundation for their argumentation to affirm the deity of Christ? The foundation, yes. like scriptural foundation. Yes. Oh, I mean, John 1, Colossians 1, the, I mean, the whole gospel of John, John 5, John 8, John 12. Uh, it's clear you can't, you can't say the things that are stated about Jesus. Uh, I mean, just working your way through the book of John, uh, Jesus claims the titles of God. Jesus demonstrates the power of God. Jesus receives worship. I mean, that was the, the big one for me. I, I, you know, when I personally, when I was wrestling through not whether or not Jesus was God, but just more how do I know what I know, um, real, recognizing when, when people bow down and worship Christ, uh, when people do that to angels in the New Testament, angels say, no, don't do that. Stand up, stand up. Uh, Jesus, it's, it's C.S. Lewis's, you know, he's either Lord, liar, or lunatic, and he receives worship. And so at Nicaea, those arguments were made like, look, he, he has divine prerogative, divine power, divine authority, divine names, divine titles, receives worship reserved for God alone. Uh, it's clear he is God. I mean, even passages like Romans 9, 5 talk about Christ, who is God over all. I mean, it's, it, it's not true if anybody says the New Testament, Jesus never says, I'm God. Like, the Jews were ready to stone him because it was so clear they knew what he was saying. Second question, okay, and there's some in our day who firmly believe that the Reformation of the 16th century was basically a tragic event because in the opinion of some, it unleashed a spirit of anarchy and it broke the unity of the professing church. And the appeal is made to Jesus' prayer in John 17 that the church would be one, unified. In light of that, could you give us a general overview of the theological developments that took place in the Western church throughout the Middle Ages that led to the need 
for Reformation, and what, in your opinion, constitutes the main spiritual characteristics of this movement that would then justify it as a genuine movement of the Spirit of God? Yeah, that's a, I hope everybody's got, got some time. Uh, we have five to seven minutes. Okay. How, how we got to the Reformation uh, when going all the way back to 450 to 500 AD when Rome fell gradually, uh, people, when society started to crumble, people focused on just getting by, just making it through the day. Uh, people lost the ability to read. Uh, culture dwindled. Um, reading is so important. And people began to be dependent upon what the local priest said. And for a few hundred years, that was okay. It was okay. The church didn't go apostate overnight. Uh, it, it was gradual. But by the 800s and 900s, uh, you had a corruption in, Paul tells Timothy, keep a close watch on, on, your, on your teaching and on your, on your life, your, your doctrine and your conduct. And you had a corruption of both in church leaders by the 800s and the 900s. Um, there, there are stories of popes who had their own brothels uh, and illegitimate children and, and as, as the priests, so the people. Um, it's true in Isaiah's day. It's true throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, the gospel had been lost. Uh, how, how is one made right before God became a matter of listening to the priest and doing whatever he said, going to communion. Uh, it was an emphasis on works. Uh, I know the, the Roman Catholic Church says they've always taught grace, and grace is present in Catholic writings, but it's also commingled with works. You must go through all these hoops and go to Mass and you know, give to the Roman Catholic Church and be baptized a certain way and, and so forth and so on. Um, mixed, mixed in with that were false doctrines, things like purgatory, uh, things like prayers to the saints, uh, you, you had the teachings on indulgences, the treasury of merit that um, basically was a, a form of works righteousness where you, you paid for the good works of other people to cover you. Um, and and the, the gospel of simply turning from your sin and trusting in Jesus was perverted and corrupted. Uh, the church was the church in name only by the time you got to the 1400s. That's not to say that everybody was totally lost. You had faithful men. You had, you know, John Huss, you had Peter Lombard, you had Wycliffe, uh, you had, you had um, Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, faithful men throughout even the Dark Ages who knew the gospel uh, and, and wrote on the gospel. But, but sadly, they were few and far between. Um, we pray that they had a ministry among people who have no record that we don't know about. It's not that the gospel was ever totally lost, but it was largely obscured. So by the time you get to the time of Luther, who's terrified over his own soul, he knows, I mean, Ecclesiastes, God said eternity in all our hearts, Romans 1, we know that we, there's a creator, we're going to stand before him, and that was true in Luther's life. He knew that there was heaven and hell, and he knew that he wasn't right before God, he just didn't know how to get there. And he spent 10 years uh, being a monk, trying to earn his way to God, and he couldn't do it, terrified and, and tortured, and even after he wrote the 95 Theses, he started reading and teaching. He was a teacher of scripture. He started reading and teaching through Romans and Galatians, and he says in his own testimony that that's when he realized it's the just shall live by faith. The, the, the person who is justified, the one who is right in God's eyes, shall live, not just physically, but spiritually, by faith, by trusting. The just shall live by faith. And Luther turned and trusted, and he started writing. And it wasn't just him. And this is answering your question as well. How do we know it's a, a work of God? It wasn't just one man, it, and, he, and it wasn't just Luther impacted all the others. There were men all over it right around the same time. Uh, you had you know, a guy named Martin Bucer. You had uh, even the Anabaptists. Uh, some were odd, but many were faithful. You know, a guy like George Blaurock and, and, and others, you had Ulrich Zwingli, uh, who, who had been a priest and, and a pagan at the same time, who is converted as well, all, all independent of one another. The one thing that tied them all together was that the word of God was being unleashed. Uh, thankfully, God's sovereign over all, over all history. So you have the Renaissance and the printing press and God's sovereignty in getting the word out. Uh, but as the word of God is unleashed on society and people are able to actually have time to read and understand it for themselves, uh, the spirit of God worked through the word of God to call people to God. Um, and that's why we needed a reformation. 
It wasn't a division of the true church. That church in that day was apostate. It, it, was, it was the reforming of the true church. It wasn't a division of the true church. It was God calling his church. That's what church means, the called out ones, calling them out of darkness into light. It wasn't a tragedy. It, it, it was a triumph. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Steve. Judge? We didn't plan this, but uh, my oh. questions are going to be flowing from some of the stuff that we've just been talking about uh, with regards to the deity of Christ. What's the connection between the deity of Christ and this thing we celebrate at Easter called the resurrection? Uh, adding to that, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, tells us that the resurrected Christ provided many infallible proofs that he was alive. If you were talking to a young believer, weak in the faith, what infallible proofs would you cite? Where would you find them from? If you were talking to uh, an inquiring but unconverted skeptic, from a local junior college or from a local college campus, uh, what would you cite? Would your conversation be different or would they be similar and how so? I, it would be different for the person that I was fairly confident or, or at least even just hopeful that they're a believer. I would, I would talk to them about how we know things from, from apologetics, that, that we do have a reason, as First Peter 3.15 says, uh, to make a defense for the hope that we have within us I'm, I mean, our very calendar is based around this man. You know, the, he changed the course of world history. He inspired men to not just die for him, because uh, any type of religious fanatic can inspire men to die for him, but they, they lived for him. He inspired, uh, in just a short amount of time, uh, thousands upon thousands of people to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. All right, counsel, give me some infallible proofs. Uh, he showed himself to 500 people, as we see from the scripture. He appeared to them resurrected. I mean, Thomas, he said, feel my hands. Uh, it's me. He, he ate fish. That's why, that's why the, the gospels make a point to say, like, he actually ate food. He's not a ghost. He, uh, he can eat food and be, be touched. That's why John says in 1 John, we've not just seen and heard, because you can see and hear a ghost, ostensibly, but we touched him with our hands. Like, he, 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 was not, he was not a phantom. He definitely rose from the grave, and that was eyewitnessed by people who, like I said, denied themselves, take up their cross, and lived for him for decades after that. Any other biblical passages? Well, if I were talking to the, to the unbeliever, I would do what we talked about this earlier today, what Dr. Chow said. I would, I would preach the gospel. You know, people raise all sorts of objections. Um, you just preach the truth of God's word. You talk about, you talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, and the second Corinthians okay. 4 says, God shines the light of the gospel in the heart of the person listening. All right. And don't forget about 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, yeah. And uh, you were actually on a location in your time in Israel where that may have occurred. Mm -hmm. You remember where that was? You know, oh, the tomb of the Holy, Holy Sepulcher. And? Oh, Gordon's tomb. Okay. Go ahead. All right. That's the touristy stuff. Okay, now let's uh, <laughs> pull up something that you've already... I, I was thrilled to hear you refer to uh, 1 Timothy 4.16 uh, and also into Acts 20. Acts 20, verse 28. And I think this is one of the most important questions that a prospective pastor or elder... Uh, should ever face in their own life. Paul says, keep watch. What are you to keep watch for, and what are you to do with the information that you obtain while keeping watch? What are you keeping watch for in the life of Steve Crawford? And what are you gonna do with that? What are you gonna keep uh, watch for in the life of uh, this church? Well, Paul says keep watch on your on your conduct and on your teaching, on your life and your doctrine. Uh, I think one of the biggest warning signs in my own life where I need to actually turn and pay attention is when I, I start to see complaining. Uh, if, if I see an attitude of, of bitterness or complaining or selfishness, that, that needs to be a, 
a, a red alert of something's off uh, because the, the Paul says the mark of an unbeliever is not an unbeliever, but somebody acting like an unbeliever too, uh, is, is lack of gratitude, lack of gratefulness. Um, the mark of a Christian is someone who is grateful, thankful, humble, recognizing that it's that phrase we use often, better than I deserve, but that, that needs to be true. So that's like the first warning sign that something's amiss. Is, is, uh, it's, a, it's an insipid thing that comes in your mind like, I deserve better than this. I, yeah, I, you know. So that's, that should be the first warning sign. So keep a watch on yourself. And obviously on your teaching, we need to be always learning, always submitting ourselves to Scripture. If something seems off, uh, contrary to the, the doctrine that we know, that we teach, um, obviously we need to be relentless with ourselves, um, gracious with others. Uh, one thing I've learned, uh, if I hear somebody maybe holding to a view that is different, uh, theological things, obviously there's matters of first importance that Paul talks about in First Corinthians. Uh, there are certain things that somebody can't, say when it, when it comes to, to doctrine then, and still be a Christian. If they deny the deity of Christ or the virgin birth or the resurrection or the substitutionary atonement, uh, that's when you, you dive in right away and you say, hold on, this is not okay. But if it's something secondary, you know, something, maybe a differing view of, depending on it, like on baptism or eschatology, like hold back, don't rush into judgment, be aware, but just ask a lot of questions. I think that's the big thing. Uh, what, what do I do when my warning sign starts to, warning alarm starts to go off, uh, recognize I don't know everything and ask a lot of questions and ask more questions, ask more questions and figure out where this person is coming from. All right. So, relentless with myself, gracious with others. Now you mentioned Arius. You, you described him uh, in light of Acts chapter 20 a few minutes ago. Do you remember what that was? Uh, he was a, like a savage wolf who came in among the flock. Okay. So you watch out for ravenous wolves. Right. Anything else that you watch out for? Uh, I mean, talking about savage wolves that would come in among the church would be like somebody in the church who sees church as an opportunity to promote themselves. Somebody like Diotrephes and yes. Third John, who's selfish, self-centered. They start, they may have a ministry or the way they do sermons or even sermon illustrations, it, it it starts being more about them and not about the Lord and about their agenda, their, their self-promotion. That's probably the first major warning sign. When somebody claims to be a slave of Jesus Christ but talks more about themselves than about Christ, that's when you, you need to have your, your eyebrows definitely raised. Okay, tell us more about Diotrephes. What was his character like? How did he pervert the process of church discipline? Uh, he's one of those that comes from within. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. tell us more. Well, he's only mentioned in a few verses in Third John, but he's, he's apparently somebody who saw church as his own personal playground. He used the things of God to promote his own agenda, his own kingdom. He wouldn't listen to John's apostolic authority. Uh, he, he even... Uh, he didn't like these traveling missionaries that, that the recipient of Third John, a guy named Gaius, who was, John commended him for caring for these traveling missionaries, people who went out for the sake of the name. Uh, Diotrephes, instead, I, I'm, I'm reading in the white spaces here, but my guess is he, he sees these men who are commended by John and by the church as threats to his own personal empire. And so he says, you know what? No, we're, we're sending them, we're, we're not sending them out, we're shutting them out. And then he shuts out anybody who tries to support them. He, he has no time for John, no time for faithful missionaries, no time for Gaius. It's, it's all about him. He sees church okay. as, as him. And we need to be on guard against that even in our own lives. We're, like, we're getting ready for church on Sunday morning. If I'm, when I'm picking out my shirt or my tie and it's more about you know, what will people think and it's not about giving honor to Christ, that's in, even in a small, silly, ridiculous way, walking in the steps of diatrophies. Very good. good. The, uh, the follow through actually took another question, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Bart. That's great. All right, let's have one rapid fire question from each of you, and then, and then we're going to get to the break time. So, so one, one rapid fire question. Go ahead, Dr. Chow. So, since my questions were so long winded before, <clears throat> this, is, this should be really quick. Someone walks up to you and says, 
Who wrote the Pentateuch? One word answer. Moses. Okay, good. <laughs> now, that's a surprisingly difficult answer in academic circles, so oh, yeah. good, good work, Steve. Yeah, yeah, good and job. he didn't blush. He just said Moses. That's Moses. No Thank you. I appreciate that. I thought it was God that wrote the book, of the Pentateuch. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Bill, or Dr. Yeah. Webster, go ahead. <laughs> if you had to pick one hero from church history for your own personal life, who would it be and why? I can't pick one. It's it's St. Patrick and Martin Luther. St. Patrick, when I mean, he's enslaved by the Irish, and he goes back. He leaves what could have been a cushy life. He goes back, never gets married spends decades in Ireland, and by the time he dies, Ireland is sending missionaries back to continental Europe. And they, it went from pagan, godless, you know, druids and Celts worshiping, you know, all sorts of fertility gods to a center of Christian scholarship and sending missionaries. And then Luther, you know, for the Diet of Worms, here I stand, I could do no other. You know, he, he doesn't know if he's leaving Worms alive he, he, I mean, they might as well just drag him out and burn him at the stake. He says, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Amen. Good. One of your longtime Sunday school teachers is married with three children and is a fireman for the local city fire department. I have no idea if that's true in this church or not, but speaking <laughs> hypothetically. Tragically, he dies one Saturday night while fighting a fire. You're called to the hospital where you interact with the family who have just heard the news. What biblical passages do you bring to their attention? How do you interact with them? Uh, well, I, I would first, for my own self, I, I, Romans 12, weep with those who weep. I, I would, I'm, depending on the person and, and how well I know them, I, I wouldn't necessarily start preaching at them. I want to cry with them for a while, sit with them um, in time. And, and depending on how well I know them, that time may be sooner or, or later, but in time, point them to the goodness of God. Um, one thing that Bart's helped me think through is that, that God weeps. Uh, God is not cold and robotic. He, he grieves with those who go through tragedy. Um, point them to the heart of God. And the, the main thing I would point to is, is the cross. Uh, obviously, in the right time, the cross, that Christ suffered. God, God was pleased and also it, it, it did not bring him joy to crush his son. But God loved the world that he gave his son. Um, Christ said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus went through the deepest agony. Um, and how do we make sense of this tragedy and, and the goodness of God? You look at the cross. That's great. Well, good work, Steve. You've earned a break. So we're going to take about a 10-minute break. But I would love for the judge and Dr. Webster, you, this is, you're done for tonight. You're going to watch the next section. Do you have just a couple of sentences to encourage Steve with before we take a break? Just a couple of scriptures? That's up to or, you. Or just, well, just, brother, it is pure joy for I know for your dad and I to be here for Abner to be here and to be able to affirm you to see how you've grown and what a joy it is to know that the Lord has his hand on you and just can't wait to see what he's going to do with your life for his glory It's been amazing for us uh, ever since Steve moved back here. Um, I don't know how many of you are unaware of this, but Steve's grandmother uh, and the family on his, on my mother's side actually lived in the Hutchinson Haven area for the better part of a century and farm. And we're just amazed that God is here, has, has Steve here. Um, I pulled out the history books. I was telling the men this while we were over at dinner uh, in the family, and I found that, Steve, you have five ancestors going back over 400 years who served faithfully as a pastor. 
I don't know that I'm going to get through this completely dry eyed tonight or tomorrow, but um, that legacy and these men were different backgrounds, different denominations. They all loved Christ and they were all committed to being faithful to his gospel. And with that, we have an encouragement to charge for you that you will continue to live that out. One of the things that was great for me this afternoon was being able to explain to my grandson, and I think my granddaughter was listening, what ordination is all about, what it means. There were a couple of great uncles of yours who did not continue faithful, and we would encourage that to never be the case in your own life. But we're so thankful. I don't think I can say much more, Bart. That's great. Okay, well, we're, we're going to take about a 10 to 15 minute break. When you hear Pastor Hadley playing, that means come back in and find your seat. We've got the cake out there. The cake is to help you get some energy to come back. Okay, so get some cake, come back. We've got another half hour. We're going to have New Testament Bible knowledge and systematic theology for the next 30 minute session so cake worship 30 minutes bless you cake well if you're in here i invite you to stand with us we're going to sing in christ alone Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still.
All right, well, we've freshened up the stage a little bit, added our brother Terry Druard uh, to the stage to help us with some systematic theology type questions. Again, we have uh, Dr. Chow, and what we're going to do is pretty similar to the last time, just one less discipline, one less person. So we're going to start with a couple of brief answer questions. Like one to three normal sentences. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Keep it lively. Okay. Okay. All right. Can I, can I share real quick that why I'm thankful that Terry's up here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That'd be great. I'm just, I've always respected Terry. Um, uh, it was really important to me that at least one man on the, on the council was an elder from this church because uh, uh, ordination is something done by, by a a, den a denomination, but in our case, our local body. So I wanted at least one member to be one of our elders. And what I've always, appreci always appreciated about Terry is not just his, his depth of doctrine, but the first thing that comes out of his mouth when you ask him how he's doing is that he's grateful to be saved. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, I'm just thankful for Terry. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Sounds good. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for asking and um, it's a privilege it's good all right dr chow we have new testament and new testament hermeneutics so yeah. fire away okay so this is the quick round right or the quick round yeah yeah okay. air quotes so steve even during this conference young people were asking about the role of women in the church uh, particularly based on first timothy 2 and such so give us a synopsis of the New Testament role of women. How do you know? What are the passages? The, the main ones would be 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 Timothy 2. Not 1 Corinthians 13, 2 Corinthians. Uh, no, I'm blanking on it. It's, it's in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. <laughs> uh, uh, that women are to, uh, essentially how I explain it to the youth, women can do everything men can do except what God says they cannot do. And we see in First Timothy 2, they, they cannot teach men or exercise authority over men. Uh, the, the usual re rebuke is, or retort is, isn't that cultural or particular to Ephesus? Uh, teaching and exercising authority is something that transcends culture. Uh, the Word of God is, is authoritative. The Word of God is not a TED Talk. The Word of God is thus saith the Lord. And that's something that is not just particular to Ephesus or to the first century, but to all churches, all time. There's no way to teach in a New Testament style of teaching that isn't authoritative. So when we see, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, that is binding on all Christians, all churches, all places throughout all time. And why? In essence, it's because God set it up this way. And not, it's not just punting. He set it up this way to reflect his structure. He has, he has roles. There's roles within the Trinity, and there's roles within his church. And we reflect his character by, by obeying what he said in this area of roles. Yeah. So it's 1 Corinthians 11 and 14. So you, okay. you, kind of, you basically got it because, you know, 13 is kind of an average. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was like, it's... nope, 13 is about love. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> It's not Second Corinthians 13. It's, oh, boy. Yeah. So, and, and if you panic in, in future situations, you just say, it's found throughout First Corinthians. Yeah. And, and then kind of smooths things over with people. <laughs> All right. I'm supposed to give another question, yes? Yeah. So uh, talk, talk quickly with, with someone who reads James 2, shocked that it seems so contradictory to Paul, not the first person in church history to ever have that reaction. And they're just desperate for an answer, and they want it quick. So give them the quick answer. Yeah, uh, James 2, talking about faith and faith and works. You show me your faith by, by your works. I'll show you my faith with works. Uh, what, it's not contradictory to Paul at all. Uh, what it is is true faith always results in a changed life. Uh, you, you demonstrate the authenticity of a changed life, of, of true faith with the fruit of a changed life. Uh, works do not earn us, but they prove us. Great. All right, Terry, some systematic theology for us. Here you go, Steve. 
how do you explain the term reformed to a person unfamiliar with reformed teaching? Right. Well, reformed comes out from the era of the Reformation, essentially has to do soteriology. I mean, there are, there are other areas as well, but one of the, the primary issues is, is that of how is a man made right before God. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, said for centuries it was essentially through works. Uh, and then there was a work by God uh, through many men uh, in, a, in a short period of time in which people recovered the real gospel. Um, and you can sum it up in the sovereignty of God and salvation. God is the one who seeks, saves, calls men out of darkness into light. Uh, he's the main actor. Um, salvation is, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Um, that is reformed soteriology. There are other attendant doctrines that go with it, um, but the, the main one is, is how is a person made right before God? That's good. Is faith a gift or a response? If it is a gift, why are people responsible for exercising it? It is, it is a gift, and people are responsible for exercising it. We are incapable of doing so, and that's what makes the gospel so great. Uh, it, again, we have to step back and, and not put God in our courtroom of fairness. Um, God does call all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17.30. We, all people everywhere, you know, Isaiah 45, turn to me, all the ends of the earth, be saved. There's a call and a summons, but people can't do that unless God gives them the gift of faith. Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The this, the antecedent, is not the grace, it's the faith, because saying that, Paul saying, emphasizing this is not of yourselves, it would be redundant for Paul. <laughs> you can't read Paul and, and, and think that grace is, oh, okay, you're clarifying that grace is from God. Okay, no, uh, the, the this, the antecedent, has to be the faith. The faith is the gift, and yet all men everywhere are required to do it because God is eminently trustable and trustworthy. He's worthy of all trust. Uh, it's only right for us to exercise trust, but our hearts are so, apart from Christ, our hearts are so perverted, deceitful, desperately wicked that we don't want to. And that's why we're in desperate need of God changing us, giving us that faith, which is a gift of grace that he does hold us accountable to exercise, but, but we need him to give it to us. That's great. How about you give us a couple of New Testament questions where Steve can elaborate on just a little bit. Yeah, so you mentioned earlier, Steve, that if you were counseling an individual who really was wrestling with assurance of salvation, particularly say, because of a warning passage in Hebrews, that, that even in your own experience, it was walking through Hebrews that strengthened your faith. So here's the question. Walk us through Hebrews 6 a little bit and help us to wrestle with that. It's okay if I look at it. Hebrews sure. Six. Okay. Walk as long you. as you normally carry a Bible when you answer people's questions. Do you do that? <laughs> Well, usually it happens in my office, <laughs> yeah. and I so, want to demonstrate okay. the authority of the Word of God. No, yeah. uh, Hebrews 6, uh, for it is impossible to restore. To no, it's really okay. You oh, okay. All right. I was like, oh, no. Coffee? Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Bart. I normally walk around and hold his coffee. Oh, that, that's yeah. good. <laughs> so... At uh, least you carry a phone around. I guess you could use that to pull it that's up. That's right? true. There we go. That's See, true. Tools of the trade, right? Tools of the trade. Well, Hebrews 6 is one of five major warning passages. Uh, that, well, if you count 3 and 4 as one, you have 2, 3 and 4, 6, 10 and 12. Um, yeah, uh, Paul says, I'm sorry, uh, the writer. Uh, That's okay. Uh, sorry. The I, I'm I pretty agree. good with okay. that. Okay, I agree. Most of the church agreed until about 150 years ago. But, uh, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washing, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible, this is the verse that usually sends people into a spiral, it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away 
to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Um, I'll talk about verse 9 in just a second because that's an encouraging part. But you've got to step back and say, what, what is the context of Hebrews? You can't just parachute into 6. That's what really tripped me up, was just getting sucked into just these few verses of 6 and just these few verses of 2 and 3 and 4 and 10 and 12. And I remember you telling me one time, like, you're reading the Bible selfishly. You're taking out Esau's name and you're putting your own name in there. Stop yeah. it. Uh, uh, you've got to step back and say, what's going on in Hebrews? Uh, there's persecution is on the rise. The, 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 the boiling pot is being turned up more and more and more, and it's getting more and more uncomfortable to be a follower of Jesus Christ. These were ethnically Jewish individuals. That's why it's called Hebrews. Ethnically Jewish individuals who, for the most part, had made a profession of faith in Christ. Uh, for many of them, it was genuine. It was an authentic, genuine profession of faith. But for some of them, it was potentially nominal in the Roman Empire, there was certain protections that Jewish people were allotted uh, and Judaism uh, until later in the first century and going to the second century, Judaism was left alone for the most part. Uh, but Christians didn't have that same legal protection. Mm. Jews were exempt from saying Caesar is Lord uh, because the Ro Rome, we see this in Pilate's life, Rome didn't want to deal with an uprising in Palestine. Uh, but Christians didn't have that exemption. And so some of these professing individuals who were Jewish by ethnicity uh, and supposedly Christian by profession were tempted, like, life would be easier if I still said I loved God, but I just went back to Judaism. And the writer of Hebrews is making it very clear, if you do this, if you do this, you are, you're not, you're not making a minor faux pas. You're, you're putting the lie to Jesus Christ. You're essentially saying, Jesus is a liar. Jesus is not who he said he was. He's a fake, a phony. The cross doesn't matter. Uh, the cross is, is worthless to me. Uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying that this is no small thing. And, and they would have known what they were saying. It wasn't, it, it's not, the person who gets sucked into Hebrews 6 he thinks like, if I had a bad thought about Jesus, then I must be lost forever. That's, it's not, it's not just some random thought that came into your mind. This is a conscious decision to say, I am purposely disassociating myself with the community of faith, even though I've heard sermons. That's tasting of the word of God. I've heard sermons. I've seen the gospel change people all around me. I've seen the power of God working through the word of God in the life of his church. I've experienced the kindness of God mediated through genuine believers who've shown me God's love, you know, uh, God making his love manifest through believers. Uh, so they've tasted God's kindness, they've seen God's power, and yet to save their own skin, they are going to publicly, re publicly repudiate uh, who Jesus is and turn their back on uh, true followers of Christ. And if somebody does that, it shows there is no hope for that person. They have, they have shut the door on, on being one of Jesus' disciples because they've made a conscious effort to say Jesus is a liar and I'm right with God by going back to, in this case, Judaism, but I mean, you could, by application, do it to anybody who would apostatize today. And I'd say if, 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 if that's not where your heart's at, if, if you're not, not just some random weird thought that came to your mind, but this, if, you're, if your heart is not the, making that big public repudiation of Christ, Hebrews 6, and the writer of Hebrews is actually confident that the readers didn't commit Hebrews 6 because he says in verse 9, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's good. And yeah, a tip on just from Greek, just to help kind of a person come to the realization of what, what you just articulated is uh, that word fall away is parapipto in Greek. And in the opening phrase of parapipto, you can hear the word para, or where we get the word parallel. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean if you're par like the dreaded parallel parking or whatever? And you're hypothetically in parallel parking, 
you never hit the other car. That's never been my case, but <laughs> just kidding. I, that's why I don't do it. Um, but, <coughs> but parallel means you never intersect. And what these people have done is they've made a conscious decision to never intersect Christ. Mm -hmm. They never were saved and they never will be because they said, I will always be parallel. That's how I will fall alongside. It wasn't that they fell out right. of Christianity, they fell along it. And that is the idea of parapipto. And that, that just illustration, I think, sometimes can help solidify in people's minds what is going on. You want nothing to do with Christ. You never did. Now it's just obvious. So that's good. Am I supposed to ask another question? Is that that'd be that? great? Or you can okay. keep answering them if you want. Oh no 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 no. <laughs> we well, were Dane Abner. Need a break. <laughs> <laughs> Surrogate ordination, right? Um, no, we we. Well, that's the systematic question, right? Penal substitutionary atonement. But we don't do penal substitutionary ordination. Um, yeah, I had that in my notes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Steve, walk people through a glorious epistle like Ephesians. And um, give us a high view of God and salvation and the church and all of that. Um, it's really important. Well, I was really thankful that you asked that question. Yeah. I didn't tell you this, but I'm preaching through Ephesians right now. Oh, but, well, good. Yeah. Give it to uh, us. The, the heart of Ephesians is uh, chapter 4, verse 1, that you walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Um, uh, the, the first three chapters deal with that calling and just how amazing it is, uh, how God takes lost, dead, rebellious. Uh, they, they, they are completely lifeless, except they, all they can do is just have a fist in God's face. That's it. Uh, dead rebels. And, and take dead rebels who, as, as Titus says, they, they hate God and hate one another. And through his gracious acting in their lives uh, that's made possible only because of the gospel. God takes lost dead rebels who hate God and hate one another, changes them completely from the inside out, gives them a new home, a new purpose, new life, a new direction, uh, and love for one another. So the first three chapters deal with how God has, since before the foundation of the world, mm -hmm. chosen those whom he will save. Uh, God, God has it not, he didn't look ahead and say, these ones will choose me. It's he set his love on them. Mm -hmm. he, he foreknew them and he chose them, elected them, said, I pick this one because of his love for them. He predestined us in love to be his sons. And so chapter one deals with uh, how God chooses those who belong to him. He, he foreknows them, which is uh, his, his favor on them. He, he chooses them in love. And he says, these will be mine. And then at the right time, uh, we, this is chapter two, at the right time in history, God calls individual sinners from a life of deadness where they're just, they're dancing to Satan's tune even if they don't realize it. They're walking to the, according to the prince of the power of the air. And he says, your mind come from awaken, like to Lazarus in the tomb, come out. And they come to life. And then he gathers them into his family. Well, first he regenerates them by grace through faith. Uh, and he gives them jobs to do, you know, prepared beforehand for good works. We are his workmanship. Uh, Paul does a, a, a play on words there. You think, anybody tempted to think that salvation is by works? No, you're not the one, you're not the one working. You are actually the one being worked upon. In fact, you are a work. You're not doing works. You are a work. We are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we may walk in them. And then he takes, this is the latter half of chapter two, he takes people who look completely different from one another. They don't have anything in common other than the fact that they've been dead in their sins and brought to life by Christ, and he gathers them into a family. You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jew and Gentile um, are equal at the foot of the cross and united in the, in the family of God. And then in chapter 3, we see God's glorious calling. Specifically, Paul has an aside in the first part of chapter 3 where he talks about his own personal ministry and how God gave him a work to do, uh, to, to be a proclaimer of the gospel. Uh, now, Paul was specifically an apostle. We're not apostles, but God has given all of us the, the job of evangelism. And just as Paul was given the responsibility to proclaim God's good news, part of the beauty of the gospel is that God lets us do that as well. And chapter 3 wraps up with just the strengthening power of God. 
God, God calls us out of darkness into light because he chose us before the foundation of the world. And then he gives us a job to do, and then he strengthens us. And why does he do that? Because he can do far above beyond what we can ask or think. That's the glorious calling. That's chapters 1 through 3, it's sometimes summed up as um, the Christian's position. And then you have the Christian's practice in chapters 4 through 6, the so what. That's what God did. So what are these good works that we should do uh, that, he, that, that we can walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called? Well, first it's within the church. Chapter 4 talks about uh, how God gave the church for one, but then he also gave, because of the, the incarnation, the, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, uh, Jesus won the victory. He won the victory and he gave gifts to men. Uh, he, some of those gifts are God's giving of people to the church, pastors, shepherds, teachers, but, but also we see from Ephesians and then in the parallel passages in Romans and in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Peter chapter 4 that the gifts are both individuals and also spiritual gifts uh, that, that we use in the church to build up one another, to sharpen one another, iron sharpening iron uh, as, as every member of the body uses their spiritual gifts uh, the first way we walk worthy is being involved in the local church. Then Paul starts uh, fleshing out how we walk worthy in our communication. We, we speak honestly to one another. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped over. We say no to sin. We, we, we put to death sin. We say no to sin. We're renewed in our inner man, constantly going back to the word of God and the spirit of God to be renewed. And we put on uh, new life, new habits, new choices. So we walk worthy in the church. We walk worthy in our personal conduct. We walk worthy uh, in our communication. We, we are eager to forgive. We are tenderhearted to one another. We speak the truth to one another. And then we walk worthy uh, in, in our family life. Well, we walk worthy in purity. We say no to the works of darkness, but instead we expose them. Uh, we're chapter 4 going into chapter 5. Uh, we are people of purity. Uh, we are uh, people who walk worthy in marriage. Husbands walk worthy by, by dying to themselves and putting their wife's preferences ahead of their own Wives walk worthy by submitting to the leadership of their husbands. Uh, and then we walk worthy, uh, slaves to masters uh, and, and children to parents. Uh, in various situations or relationships in life, we walk worthy by being like Christ. Uh, and then the book closes, we walk worthy in taking our stand against the evil one, mm -hmm. uh, putting on the full armor of God. We walk worthy in, in um, taking on the whole armor of God and, and, and uh, resisting the attacks that come from our enemy. So what God did for us, and then that's chapters one through three, and then what we do uh, in response, how do we walk worthy of the, the glorious calling? Yeah. No, amen, and that's wonderful. Just two quick thoughts, and this will help sharpen, I think, some things. I mean, even when you're talking about in Ephesians 3, Paul, why does he go into this long testimony about himself? We cannot forget that the opening line is, I, Paul, the prisoner, Mm -hmm. of Christ Jesus and what Paul is demonstrating there is that the gospel is so glorious and what God has done is so amazing that even for him this prisoner he's free that yes I'm a prisoner not of Rome not of Caesar but of Christ right and that although it should be shameful it's the best badge of honor in light of the gospel and that tells you how powerful the gospel is. And, and likewise, as you mentioned over and over, I think it's helpful for our people to know that Paul, in Ephesians 4 through 6, repeats the word walk. Yes, walk not like the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Walk in love. Walk circumspectly. And that helps to break down the passage exactly like, like you described. So... Yeah, this is all very good. Wonderful. Thanks. Good stuff. All right, some systematic theology that Steve can chew on for a while. Okay, and you had mentioned in your answer to Dr. Chow that we're to walk in purity, yet we sin. The things I want to do that I don't do, the things I don't want to do that I do. The Bible doesn't teach perfectionism in this life, it, so people sin. Mm -hmm. What is the effect of a Christian sinning? Uh, it's, it's multifaceted. Um, Peter exhorts his readers to conduct yourselves with fear during the stay of your exile. Be holy, for I am holy. Um, one, one of the first, you just see in, it starts in chapter 1, but in chapter 2 and chapter 3, 
oh, one of the byproducts of a Christian sinning is that you bring shame upon the name of Christ. You, you, you chip away at your testimony and your credibility before a watching world. So one of the first, I would say, like external impacts of a Christian sinning is you, you dishonor the Lord and you chip away at your witness. Um, Peter's exhortations in 1 Peter are, the, it, pre, it presumes upon that, you're, that you are walking in a, in a godly way, and if you don't, uh, you, you can't obey those commands. You can't, you can't have your light shine before men. Uh, that, that would be one thing. Secondly, you see this in Psalm 32. Uh, when I kept silent about my sin, I wasted away. You, you risk the right, the righteous chastening that comes from God. Psalm 32, God's hand was heavy upon David. Uh, Hebrews 12, uh, no discipline is pleasant, um, but it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. And it is painful. It's, you know, the, the phrase you can do this the easy way or do this the hard way. You can learn the easy way or learn the hard way. Um, you, you risk, well, more than just the chastening that comes from God, there's, there's relational distance. I just heard a Pastor Stefan just preached a great sermon on the fact that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere all at once. But relationally, the scripture uses terms of nearness and farness. Um, Isaiah talks about how your sins have made a separation between you and God. Now, that, that can be true of, of unbelievers, but that principle can also carry over to the life of a Christian. Uh, you see this in James 4, that when you, when you chase after a life of sin, it's spiritual adultery and it puts a wedge between you and God. The remedy is to draw near, but that presupposes that there's some distance. You don't want to live far off from the Savior because that actually, I heard Dr. MacArthur preach a sermon on, on how Peter fell. Even he, his cowardice led to greater sin on the night of the crucifixion because he was following too far. Um, you, the sheep needs to stay close to the shepherd, and the, and the further away a sheep is from the shepherd, the more you run the risk of, of stumbling even further. Sin can breed more sin. John Piper has this quote, sin makes you stupid. Uh, and, and that's true for Christians. Sin, sin breeds more sin. Um, so that leads to greater shame upon the Lord, greater discredit to your testimony, uh, further chastening, which is uncomfortable. That chastening can, can look like lack of assurance, lack of peace. You know, there's the peace that passes understanding that guards your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Um, God, keep in perfect peace. Him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Isaiah 26 and Philippians 4, that, that peace can diminish. There's an experiential side of Christianity that is affected when we sin. Uh, it's uncomfortable. And then as we see in 1 Corinthians 11, if sin's not dealt with and yet you still go about your Christian life as everything's okay, um, there are physical consequences. And, and it's all connected. You know, our spiritual condition can impact our, our physical condition. Um, but there are physical consequences. Paul says, look, you, some of you have pride and selfishness. It's a me-first attitude when you come to church and you're not willing to deal with it. And then you, you take the bread and the cup. And some of you are sick because of this. And some of you, some of you have died. God can call a believer home. Uh, I mean, everything happens at the right time, but, but in one sense, it is sort of premature uh, if a Christian's not willing to deal with his or her sin. So a weakened testimony, um, dishonor to the name of Christ, uh, the chastening of God, uh, lack of assurance, uh, physical consequences, even premature death. That's really good, Steve. Let's, uh, let's turn our attention to the Lord real quick. Define the Trinity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then give two common ways it's misunderstood and why an accurate understanding matter. Yeah. Um, the, the Trinity is, is God. God is Father, Son, and Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Spirit. But they all are God. There is one God three person. Um, this is what church councils met to, to hammer out and clarify. Um, there's perfect unity within the Trinity, but the, the individual persons are, they, they, do not, they do not overtake one another. Distinct persons, one God. Um, the, the Shema in, in Old Testament, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is a a sort of composite unity, and it is, uh, I will admit it's really hard for me to explain. Um, 
see the Trinity reflected all throughout Scripture. 2 Corinthians 3.18 affirms the deity of the Holy Spirit. This is from the Lord of the Spirit. We, we talked about the deity of Jesus Christ, which is so clear from every book of the New Testament, but particularly John. You see Trinitarian formulas in 1 John chapter 5, uh, and I think one of the easiest ones that people know is, is Matthew 28, mm -hmm. baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, if the Spirit and the Son aren't God, why it would be it would be a great dishonor to baptize somebody in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. No, they all are equally God. So Deuteronomy six, here is real the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and yet we see I mean all the way back, I remember mentioned this earlier today, uh, God said, Let us make man in our image. There's there's plurality from the very beginning. In the image of God he made man. So there's singularity and yet plurality. Um how the Trinity is often misunderstood. Um, there's the idea of, of modalism, that God takes on the, the form. It's like an ice cube or, or like water. Water can be liquid or steam, a vapor, or, or solid ice. And one of, one of my favorite YouTube videos is these Irish guys saying, that's modalism, Patrick. Um, but uh, it's not that God wears different hats or takes different forms. He is distinct three persons. You see this at the baptism of Jesus Christ, all three present, the voice of God the Father, the Spirit descending like a dove on the Son. Um, uh, another way that sometimes people tend to think of the Trinity wrong, I, I would call it functional Arianism. I was trying to think of, I was working on this in between the conference ending and, and this tonight. Uh, I forget the actual technical heresy name, but functional Arianism, where like Jesus on a practical level is somehow less than God. Uh, he's, he's not. The Spirit is not less than Christ. The Son is not less than the Father. They are perfectly co-equal. Co Excuse me, co-equal. They have different roles. They are different persons, but it's one God. So I would say modalism, functional Arianism, uh, tritheism, thinking that there are three separate gods. There are not three separate gods. There's one God Three persons. How does that work? I can't explain everything, but I am grateful that the God that we worship is not one that we can fully explain. If I could fully explain God, then I would be greater than him. So why is it important to have an accurate understanding of the Trinity with that said? Well, one, that's how God's revealed himself. I mean, as, as Tozer said, what a man thinks about God is, is the best barometer of his spiritual health. It's, it's the rudder. Uh, if you have a deficient if you have an inaccurate, deficient view of God that, that doesn't comport with how he reveals himself, you're, as my, my dad used to say growing up, you're cruising for a bruising. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to go off the rails at some point. But, but two, especially when we talk about the, the deity of Jesus Christ, uh, you, you need to, and this is connected to the idea of Trinitarianism, you need to have a right understanding of who Christ is or the gospel falls apart. And you need to know who's indwelling you. The Spirit is fully divine. The Spirit is not the force in Star Wars. You, you, it, it really does blow you away. That I remember Abner saying this in Israel. David wanted to be you. Remember we were talking about Psalm 51 on the Temple Mount. You know, Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, David looked ahead 3,000 years to, to our age, and he wanted to be in the church age. He wanted to be where God himself doesn't live in a physical temple. He lives in a temple that he's making in individual sinners where he he takes up residence inside them and, and if you don't have a, a full understanding of trinitarian theology that the the person indwelling you never to leave is god very god i mean you you'll get to you'll get sucked in all types of doubts and lack of assurance but if you know that god lives in you and he's never going away then i mean that that gives you strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow right That's excellent. Well, we've, we've hit our 30-minute mark, so you're officially off the hook. But I, I'm, I'm going to say something real quick, and I'm going to ask these men, these brothers, to uh, just, just give you a personal charge and uh, their love for you as well. But, uh, and then we'll have Pastor Chuck come up, and he's going to close us out uh, with a song, I think. <laughs> right? Oh, I got that mixed up. Sorry. Uh, he's he's going to read and, and pray. He's good at, he's good at that. Uh, Steve, you you have been gifted by God in such a unique and special way. Uh, I'm thankful for it. He has given you a mind that's massive, 
and he's given you a heart that loves people, especially his sheep. And I, I pray for you, and I know with you, that he'll continue to use you uh, for his glory and the good of his people. And my one thought and charge for you is just to remember, you know, as we went through Mark and we saw Jesus calling his apostles, you know, he called them very specifically for just two things. To preach him, we always remember that. But he says to be with him. And just want to challenge you, encourage you, and push you uh, to worship Christ, to love him more than, more than ministry, uh, more than anything, to love him. Love you, brother. Take us off. Wait. Great. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe just want to address the church a little bit. Um, thank you for being here and for enduring our questions. And I hope you were edified a lot by Steve's answers. They were, they were really good. And um, I hope you understand, and I know you do, but I want to emphasize that this, this really reflects a very thorough field of knowledge. You know, in the nerd world of academia, you know, you specialize in like one thing. That's all you know. So, you know, you have a PhD, but that just means you just know a lot about the most minuscule, insignificant thing on the planet. <laughs> uh, but in pastoral ministry, because lives are at stake, you have to know the breadth, right? It's not just good enough to know the Old Testament. And then somebody says, well, what about this in the New Testament? You say, well, I'm an Old Testament guy. What do, what, what do I need to know? You ask somebody else. No, you have to know the New Testament. And if somebody asks you a, a question about theology, you can't just say, well, I just... I just exegete the word, you know, and that's all I do. And, and if somebody asks you counseling, you're like, I'm not a counselor. You, you can't do that. And Steve, you've just demonstrated to all of us that what ministry demands, because this is what the word of God demands, and this is what the word of God is. It's sufficient for all things. By the grace of God, you have it. And you need to just remember these moments because they illustrate you have it. And so you can't doubt Instead, you need to be humble and give thanks. And no one can improve, really, on what Bart has said in, in the exhortation to love Christ. I mean, that is the central exhortation of Scripture. And to be with him, that is the focal point of sanctification. Sanctification is us being transformed to be like Christ from glory to glory. That's what it is, 2 Corinthians 3. But if there is an appendage upon that or a corollary to that, you have a wonderful church here. These people love you. They love Christ. It's so obvious. It's, it's irrefutable. And so my heart for you would be that you spend many good years enjoying loving one another. As you grow in the Lord and as you're used by him, you know, from you're you're really everyone here jokes about how you're a Californian. I wasn't going to say that, but <laughs> but you do come from grace and you do come from masters. <clears throat> and so when when I was mentioning it, you know, they're saying, "Hey, why are you leaving town?" You know, it's like, well, I I have you know I'm going out for ordination of a former student. They say, "Who is it?" Well, do you remember Steve? Of course, we know Steve Crawford. You know. <laughs> Who doesn't know Steve Crawford, right? He worked here. He's, he's here. Tell him hi. You know, and there's like a laundry list of people. I can't, I mean, everyone that told me hi says hi. Okay, that's how I'm going to clear it. Otherwise, we'll be here all night as I list everybody out. And I just would say that an entire institution is just so proud of you. You are the product of who we are. You are our legacy. And so just serve Christ well. And we have no greater joy than to see you walking in the truth. Well, Steve, first of all, it's good to be saved, isn't it? <laughs> That's everything. I think on behalf of the other shepherds, we see in you a giftedness that the Holy Spirit has given us. Bart mentioned and 
even Dr. Chow. We've talked about that when we know we're going to do evaluations with you and with the other men. And we're thankful you're here. We know providentially the Lord brought you here and not to the other church. We're thankful for that. I heard you mention a little bit ago, and it might have been one of Dr. Chow's questions about um, if I go to an emergency room and there's someone who's passed away who's a fireman and three kids show up and so forth with a wife. And you said this. Well, first of all, I would be kind and gracious. That's really good. The Bible says, Proverbs 3, 3, do not let kindness and truth leave you. We see that in you. So, proud of you. We're glad you're here. Um, you did great tonight, by the way. How are you feeling? I'm relieved. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well done. Do you want to preach tomorrow morning? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, we'll sit here. Pastor Chuck will read and uh, pray for us, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed. Yeah. Brant, where's Brant? We need the piano. Well, Piper is correct. Sin does make you stupid. <laughs> but Steve makes us all feel stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Man. 2 Peter 5, 1 through 4. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful for this evening as we participate in something that is very special for Steve and his family. It's very special for uh, this church. And Lord, as we uh, had the privilege to just observe what many of these men have alluded to, the, the work of your spirit in Steve's life, the knowledge that you have given him and the great um, wisdom that he has, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to Work in him a heart and a love to shepherd his, your people. Those who you put under his care that he would love and he would care for and he would grow in that. Lord, we thank you for him. We thank you for this time. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.